is, we'll take your Bibles and open up in half. You'll probably come to the book of Psalms. Begin to go to your right. You'll come through the Gospels, Acts. You'll get to Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then slow down a little. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. We've been going through this study now for about, oh, I think this is our fifth week. Next week we'll conclude on the book of Colossians, begin to look at a different, uh, some different aspect, getting ready for anniversary Sunday. And so I have a couple of messages about the rocks, uh, what means these stones, and we'll look at those for a couple of weeks and then uh, continue on throughout the fall. And then look at this, another year is over, quickly has gone by uh, once again. Once you found Colossians chapter 2, we're going to focus in this morning on verses 8 through verse number 15 and talk about Christ again. Have you noticed that the book of Colossians, the focus is on who? It's on Christ. And today I want to talk about Christ is all we need. Christ is all we need. Would you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God to remain standing for a word of prayer? And then, of course, after we're done, maybe seated, then we'll get on with the message today. And we'll try to get out before dinner. Amen? Uh, we, I came from California, so our dinner is at like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding you. We'll get out by lunchtime uh, sometimes early. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, Beware, uh, lest, ye, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is a head of all princi a principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Father, this morning, we just want to praise you for Christ. Lord, if he, we don't have him, we have no life, we have no abundant life, and then we have no eternal life. I ask you this morning, Father, that as we focus on your word today, may we truly be comforted and encouraged from it. But Father, we also are going to talk this morning about some things that should cause us to be convicted as well. And we pray, God, today as your spirit speaks to us that we wouldn't be so hard-hearted and closed-minded that we would not allow you to speak to us about the things that we ought to forsake as well. Lord, we want to ask you for victory this morning and be with each one today. Again, Father, may our focus not be distracted upon anything else outside of what takes place in our hearts and our minds uh, from this book today. We give you thanks for that. Father, as always, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, may my focus be upon you today. How easy it is for us to become so distracted by the things of this world that we lose sight of you. Father, today, forgive me of the times that I lose sight of you as well. Now, Father, fill me with your spirit. I ask you, Father, for boldness and clarity and power today as only you can provide. And I thank you, Father, for what you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8, we notice the Apostle Paul, he once again begins to focus on Christ. And I think that it's easy for us to become, if you would, uh, misfocused or misdirected about Christ because we understand we have the same situation that Paul writes about of this concept of false teachers, they try to convince us something needs to be added to Jesus Christ. It's always interesting to me because we think, well, this is Old Testament and, and, or this is old days back here and, and this is not something that, that uh, we can really relate to. Well, you know, even today we notice that uh, there are folks who attempt us to distract us 
and to get us to focus on something else besides Jesus Christ. Amen? Have you noticed that how the world and cults and everything that's contrary to Christ gets us distracted and attempts us to uh, get focused on something else? I have mentioned in Sunday school this morning that Jesus, he, he truly is life. And He wants to give us life abundantly and give us eternal life. And it's interesting that the world today, no matter what ism that we're involved in, their main focus is to get us focused on the ism and to trust the ism rather than trust in Christ. Amen? You know what I mean by that? Socialism, what is that? Trusting in the government. Communism, dependency upon something else outside of Jesus Christ. And it's easy for us to do that. Because see, that's tangible. It's something that we can see rather than knowing that Christ is giving the hope that He gives to us that He's coming back again to redeem us from off of this earth, which is intangible. But that hope that's been instilled in us is all about Christ. And so our focus ought to be upon Christ Himself. And so Paul, he writes and tells them that false teachers, they're trying to convince them that there's something else we need outside of Jesus Christ. Notice that Christ doesn't want us to be, ta to be taken captive by this philosophy and vain deceit that's based on mankind's traditions rather than on the truth of Jesus Christ. Verse number 8, he says that, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After what? The tradition of men after the rudiments of the earth uh, of the world, not after Christ. This word philosophy comes from two Greek words, philo, which means love, and sophia, which means wisdom. And so what he's telling them, he said, be careful that we don't get spoiled through the love of wisdom. You ever know people who just love to know something? They just love it. They just, I just love to know something. It doesn't make any difference what it is. We just love to know something. And it's almost as if we want to love to know something just for the love of knowing something. And that's what they're talking about, these individuals. They just have the love of wisdom. Uh, they have a love of it, and they mean to love the wisdom. But notice, the love of wisdom, and wisdom itself, or philosophy itself, there's not an issue that's evil within itself. But it is when we seek it outside or apart from Jesus Christ. If we're just trying to seek wisdom for the sake of seeking wisdom, it really is, that, that's when it becomes an evil situation. Because we become to elevate that above who? Jesus Christ. We also notice when it exalts human reason above God, and it worships the creature rather than the creator. And the idea of the philosophy that's used here is to describe man's kind of attempt to find out by our own intellect those things which can only be given to us or known to us by divine revelation. It's us trying to seek something that will be one up on someone else. You know people like that? I'm just one up on someone else. I know just a little bit more than someone else. And notice, that's the idea that Paul's speaking about. He also uses the concept, the phrase, vain deceit. It refers to false or valueless teachings of those who profess to offer secret truths to an inner circle of people. You know what we call that today? <coughs> Black knowledge or dark knowledge. You heard about or the dark web. And that's what people are saying. They're focusing up on the dark web. And let's focus on that and, and let's delve into this. And, and it was interesting to me. I, I don't know if there's a dark web. I kind of believe that there is. I don't be a conspiratist. Uh, I don't want you sneaking and looking underneath the bed kind of a thing. But I believe there is kind of a dark web situation. I, I believe that. Maybe you don't have to believe if you don't want to. But there's something behind something else, if you would. Uh, there is the Oz, if you would, that kind of controls everything going on in the world. But notice something interesting. It's an individuals or people that, that begin to, to refer to this false and valueless teaching. Why? Because there's no benefit in it. No asset in it. Hey, when we delve into the dark web, all it does is become darker and pull us deeper into it. And you know what it does to us as Christians? It discourages us and gets us off track. Plain as simple as that. We become so delving into something, so deeply into something, 
that we become distracted off what Christ desires for us to get. You say, well, preacher, do you believe? And do you believe? Do you? There's a lot of stuff I believe that's absolutely vain deceit. It's valueless. It's false. It's, there's no value to it whatsoever. Amen? If you're like that, say amen. I mean, I can tell you. Hey, you know what? I know the ditty to, the, to, to Gilligan's Island. I can tell you the Flintstone story. I mean, is that valuable? When I was a kid, man, I had baseball cards. I could tell you baseball cards and and uh, ERA, and but I get kind of I don't really don't care that much for baseball today, and because their ERAs is like a batting average of the old days. You remember that? Man, ERA when I was a kid was like zero something, and or one point something, and now it's like fifty million something. It's like hey, that's a batting average, you know? It was a brag about that garbage. But you get the idea. I mean, that's that's worthless. I mean, I sit around. We'll talk about baseball cards. Yeah, that's really helpful today. Amen. So notice. We, it might be a knowledge we've accumulated, but the asset is not very good for us. It doesn't help us. Vain deceit shows that there's nothing to it, but it gathers a following by catering, guess what, to our curiosity. Our curiosity. And so both philosophy and vain deceit are according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Well, let me give you three things this morning real quickly about Christ being all we need. Three things. Number one, Christ is all we need to know about God. You know that? Christ is all we need to know about God. When I was a kid, I probably did the same thing that you did. I thought about where did God come from? And sometimes we begin to think about where God came from and pretty soon we have a headache because we can't figure it out and all it does is cause us stress and whatever else. But notice something interesting, that Christ is all we need to know about God. And look at verse number 9, he tells us this, he says, For in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You say, how did you get Christ? Because notice in verse number 8, he says, After the rudiments of the world, not after Christ, for in Him. And so notice, he's speaking in verse number 9 about Christ. And he tells us that in Him dwelleth, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, Paul constantly brings us back to the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, the book of Colossians is about Christ, and the focus is to be upon Christ. And Paul uses Colossians when he writes the letter to the church at Colossae for the purpose of bringing them and making sure they know the focus needs to be upon Christ. Why? Because there were Gnostics and false teachers and those individuals that had a love of wisdom, that followed after vain deceit. And Paul says our focus ought to be on the One who saved us. Here's something interesting. When I go to heaven, Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron and all the rest of those folks, uh, I'm not going to focus upon them. That's not who I'm going to lay my crowns at their feet. The one I'm going to lay my, my crowns at their feet is Jesus Christ. Amen? And so notice that our focus then ought to be on things that are important, on the person of Jesus Christ. In this verse, Paul presented one of the most unmistakable statements about the deity of Christ. This word fullness, it means the sum total for in Him dwelleth all the sum total, the completeness of the Godhead bodily. See, Jesus is a sum total of God and is everything that we need to know about Him and His will for our lives. Hey, it doesn't mean, by the way, that the infinite God was wholly, completely contained in Jesus' physical body. Because you know what? God could never be totally contained in a human body. Amen? And when I think about that, I think about the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, at the baptism of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, to a, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Did you notice that all three of the Godhead was there or manifested the baptism of Jesus Christ? Listen to this. Jesus, in human form, came up out of the water. 
the Spirit of God in the form of a dove landed or lighted upon Christ. Notice God the Father in a voice spoke to him. So we notice right away that not all of the, bi- of the Godhead was fastened within that human body of Jesus Christ. But notice something important. Jesus Christ, when He came to this earth, He revealed to us God in the flesh. Amen? Emmanuel, God with us. This is this. So, God, the, so the Apostle Paul, when he gave us this then, we see that he gave the accumulation of the fact that Jesus is God. Now, there, you know, have you ever had stuff before that you read that you wish you made that up? You wish it came from your mind? Oh, this is what, this right here, these three things I'm going to share. I wish I would have thought about these things. Because I read these, man, I got excited about them. And I pray you'll get excited about them this morning also. Notice first the truth of his deity going back to verse number 9. It's this, for where in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hey, that's the truth of the deity. In Christ dwelleth inside of him, came into him, is the fullness, the completion, the sum total of the Godhead bodily. Notice number two, the extent of his deity. The extent, the fullness of the, of the Godhead dwells within him, bodily dwells within him. The sum total of the Godhead is in Christ. So when Christ came, He was the extent of His deity, but He also, He was the total, the sum total of deity upon this earth. You'll say, well, at His baptism, that's when He became Christ. Oh, I know it happened when He first performed the first miracle. It was when Satan took Him out. Can I tell you something? He was born God in the flesh upon this earth. That's the extent of His deity. He didn't become God. He was God born upon this earth. The fullness of the Godhead. Look at number three. The absolute completeness of His deity. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's absolute. Absolute. You say, do you really believe that God came in the flesh to this earth? You better believe it. My eternal life is based upon it. And without that, I have no eternal life. You say, well, preacher, can you explain every detail about it? I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot explain it. I have to believe it. Because it's beyond my mind. I told you a few minutes ago, when I was a kid, man, I'd lay out there uh, on the grass and I'd stare up into space and think about where did God come from? And I tell you, after a while, it just began to give me a headache and cause it just like my mind would just be like wore out and tired and weary. And so if we try the same thing today, guess what will happen to us exactly the same thing? Because we can't figure it out because our finite, our, our finite minds cannot understand or comprehend an infinite God. But guess what? We have to believe it by faith that He came just exactly as He said that He did. And when He came, He came exactly as He said He would. God in the flesh upon this earth. Emmanuel, God with us. And so we see the fullness, the truth of His deity, the extent of His deity, the absolute completeness of His deity. He was all God and all man. Now, that's difficult to understand. Just the moment I think I'm something that I'm not, I find out I'm not anything whatsoever. I find out that I'm, that I'm flaky and find out that I, I don't have that ability that I thought that I had previously. But understand, he had the ability and was given the ability to be God when eternity passed and manifested here upon this earth. In him, in him, in Christ, dwelleth what? All, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything God can be in human flesh, He was in Jesus Christ. All that He can be in human flesh, He was in Christ. Isn't that kind of interesting that how this mere men would try to argue with Christ? Argue with God? Those folks that should have been pursuing Him and honoring and worshiping Him, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and all they wanted to do was defeat Him and destroy Him. 
and totally wipe him out and discredit all that he said. God in the flesh coming among us, among mere people. And he's, God is everything that he could have been in human flesh. He was in Jesus Christ. Notice number two, Christ is all we need to know about salvation. He's all we need to know about salvation. Look at verse 10 through verse 14. Man, I love this verse. If you don't ever memorize anything else in Scripture, if you're a born-again believer, memorize this, and ye are complete in Christ. Man, what a great thing to know. Notice again, the Apostle Paul is attacking false teachers that are pursuing after philosophy and vain deceit because they're wanting to add something else. And Paul is saying to them, all that we need is Christ. He is the one that makes us complete. Complete. I had someone tell me years ago they uh, wanted to come and work with me. And they said, well, if I come and work with you, I'll complete you. I looked at this dude and I said, there's no way, dude. You're not going to complete me. And in actuality, my wife doesn't even complete me. I say, Bridget, did you really say that? Yeah, I'll say it again. In reality, my wife doesn't even complete me. Christ completes me. Christ completes me. You know why my wife can't complete me? Because I hate to admit this, and don't you dare tell her. She's false. She's, she has faults. She's a sinner. I live with a sinner. She doesn't live with a sinner, but I do. No. I see a sinner every time I look in the mirror. I am incomplete, and so I cannot complete her. You know what our greatest thing we ever found out about our marriage is I cannot fulfill all of her needs, and she cannot fulfill all of my needs. That was the greatest thing I ever figured out in my marriage. And that's when wedding bliss started to happen. Amen? Say, seriously, your wife doesn't complete all your needs? No, she doesn't satisfy all my needs. You know why? Because my needs change just continuously. And there's no way she can keep up with that. That's almost like a hamster on a wheel. It starts to squeak after a while. Amen? But notice who can. But ye are complete where? In Him, going back to what? Going back to Christ, not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete where? In Him. In Him. He brings us completeness. Let's go on and read through this. Which is the head of, the, of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven, uh, forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Hey, Christ is all we need to know about salvation. Let me give you a couple of things first, uh, real quickly. Notice, when we heard and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we were made complete in Him according to verse number 10. This word complete is playreo, and it means furnished or filled. Originally, it referred to a ship totally outfitted and made ready for a voyage. And so notice what He has done for us. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we have everything that we need for this life's journey. There's nothing else we need. You say, wait a minute, but I love my spouse and my children and all the rest. You know, in reality, we'd still be able to live and to enjoy life's journey without people if we have Christ. Why? Because in reality, He's all we need. And we're complete. We're in Him. But isn't it a blessing to have a spouse? I know what I do sometimes. Vicki and I have talked about this. What would happen if one of us was to have some, some issues and die. What would happen to us? 
Vicky's been nagging at me from last since May. She tells me, make sure you take good care of your health. Man, I don't know why, I just had a little stroke and still good to go and still living. And I mean, I'm not, my knuckles aren't dragging too much on the ground yet. I'm still all right. And, but she's worried about stuff. And because, you know, all my life and all of our married life, I've, I've not been sick. I've had pretty good health. I've been pretty good. All of a sudden, it just hit me a little. And I was worried about it. But understand this. Her completeness is not found in her husband. Her completeness is found in Christ. And whether I live or die, it doesn't make any difference because it's not going to be found in me. Her completeness is found in Christ. In Christ. This is exactly where our completeness ought to be found. And too often we want to depend on someone else to get us through this spiritual journey, this voyage that we are. But notice that He has completed us and that we're complete so that we can be totally outfitted and made ready for the journey in which He desires for us to be on. How many of you ever, ever had an idea? You said, that, I believe this is God's will for my life. Come on, raise your hand. You haven't ever believed that before. That's God's will for my life. And then you found out it wasn't. <laughs> but I was convinced that it was. When I was going to Bible college up in Phoenix, I shared with this with you, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. Man, we were, it was a school that every, uh, every day we had chapel. And every day... They would bring in different individuals. Then I saw that uh, Wambaum, Richard Wambaum, he was the, uh, that pastor that was in Romania that they beat to death just about, and uh, they, had, they had broken his legs. and I mean, they, poor, they tore that poor guy up. He couldn't even get on the stage. They had to help him on the stage, put him in a chair. But man, he was sure powerful. He was a guy that the Romanian government uh, tried to squelch preaching about Christ. And every time that they would take him and beat him and throw him into prison, guess what happened? People got saved, and they didn't know what to do. So they moved him from prison to prison to prison. People got saved, and got saved, and got saved, and and pretty soon they thought better to do is just let him go, just get him out of our out of our country, get rid of him, because he's just turning the the whole nation over to Christ. And then he was there. I thought, man, I told Vic, I said, you know, it'd be great to go to communist country behind the Iron Curtain, and I really believe that'd be something that God would have us to do. My wife's gonna be like crazy. So the next day I'd come home and, and there was a, a missionary, this black man that was raised in Kenya and came to the States and was trained and went back to Kenya and, and then he was a church planner and, and he was an evangelist. I said, man, I told Vicky, I said, man, Africa sounds like a pretty cool place. She's saying, you got to be kidding me. But I believe it might be God's will. But notice what happens. Man, when we attempt to do God's will on our flesh, we've not been outfitted for the journey. When we try to complete it ourselves, we find out we falter. And notice something important. When we find out we're complete in Christ, then we find out that He is the one that outfits us completely and totally so that we might be able to, if you would, pursue after the journey in which He's given to us. This great voyage that He's put us on. Man, the life that He has designed for us and so notice that He's the one that does so. And when He gives us everything we need to accomplish His will, His way. Number two, we notice that we've been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. Look at verse number 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, circumcision was a typical rite of Judaism. Physical circumcision was a minor surgery, uh, the procedure which which a knife was applied to the flesh of a male child. But notice what spiritual circumcision is. It's putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. And guess who can only do that? We can't do that ourselves. No matter how much we try to be holy and spiritual and godly and all the rest, we are unable to do it in our flesh. How many ever tried to do better? I just want to do better. I'm going to try to do better. Today's a new day. I'm going to try to be better than I was yesterday. And how many of you thought the very next day you said exactly the same thing because you failed the day before? You know what our problem is? We've not counted on Christ to be the one that circumcises our heart to remove that flesh, that sin from us. Our dependency has been upon ourselves and we failed. And our dependency needs to be upon Christ. Why? Because He's the one that makes us complete. 
He's the one that if you would, outfits us for the journey that He's put us on. So our dependency should not be upon ourselves. Hey, I can't even tell you, man, those days of drunken stupor on drugs that I'd say, oh Lord, if you just get me through tonight, because I'm not sure how I'm going to get home. I'm trying to drive and I know my mind is clouded and, and, my, and all my, uh, if you would, my members of the flesh are distorted and, and I'm not sure. I'm like, Lord, if you just get me home, I promise tomorrow I'll stop doing this and I'll be better tomorrow. And guess what happened? I'm looking back the very next day saying, the same, Lord, if you just get me out of this mess I'm in, tomorrow I'll be better. Tomorrow. And finally I found out it's not me who can be better. It's allowing Christ to give a spiritual circumcision on my heart and to cut away those things that are hindering me from serving Him. Notice number three, water baptism pictures a reality, a spiritual reality. And we see in verse number 12, he said, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. We were back in, going back to Phoenix again, going to college at Arizona College of the Bible. They put up these little paper, like a three by five cards. And if you're interested in ministry at these different churches in the area, you just take the card and then you would go to that church and talk to whoever, youth director, pastor, associate, whatever, whoever it was that was looking for help in their ministry. And so I got this card one time and it was in Scottsdale and we were living back in those days uh, Phoenix and Scottsdale was divided up. I mean, it was like going a, it'd be like packing a lunch and going on a trip. It wasn't like today. You just kind of drive across town. And so we were, we were living way over on the west side and Scottsdale's way over on the east side. And so I looked at this car and said, I told Dick, I said, man, they're looking for a youth director at this church. And somebody in our class, one of the professors told me, that'd be a good fit for you. You're older than the majority of the students here, and, and you seem to have a little bit more fixed of focus, and so this would be a great place for you. So we decided on a Sunday night, I talked to our pastor, Brother Dave, and I said, Brother Dave, we're, we're going to go check out this church. They have a need of a, of a youth pastor across town, so we won't be in church tonight, and so we're going to go across town and check this place out. So we drove down there, and I've got a big old Grand Torino, I mean, big old bomb of a car. Some of you might not know what those are. Big old Ford Grand Trio. One of those are like, and so I'm driving down there. Got the kids in the back seat. We're all spiffed up and the whole bit. We pull in the parking lot. Well, before we get there, man, there's a brand new junior high school right across the street from the from the church. I'm thinking, wow, kids. And then right next door is almost a brand new high school. I'm thinking, whoa, we have hit pay dirt today, amen. Then we pull into the parking lot. And I look around thinking, Mercedes-Benz and BMWs and woo! I told him, we, man, we are downtown Charlie Brown. Man, we got it made today. And so we go in there and we find out we're the only ones carrying our Bibles. And the message the guy that was speaking was, man, it was powerful message and talked about being sinners and uh, how that you can get better uh, if you just try harder and all the rest of that. I'm thinking, whoa, this is like way far of something that we're not going to get involved in at all. And, and so I begin to look around the church like some folks do when they come into our church for the very first time because they say, Baptist, you know what's one thing that Baptists always do? And what's one thing Baptist is known for? Baptism, oh yeah, food, but baptism, amen, baptizing. And people might be looking around thinking, man, what's that baptistry? He must stick people behind this cross somewhere or do whatever. By the way, that's the baptism over there. We used it last week. And so that's our baptism, uh, uh, if you would, our trough, our spa, whatever you want to call it, over there. And so I go in this church and the pastor's standing there. And I'm thinking, man, dude, if you would have given an invitation at the end of that message that you just preached, it would be so awesome and something would have happened. So I'm looking around. And I noticed that they don't have a baptistry any place, so I asked the guy, hey, where's your baptistry? And he says, well, it's right up there. I said, right up where? It's sitting on the altar. So I'm looking around thinking, where's that, where's that thing at? And I find out, oh, he said, it's right there. And he points at it. And so, of course, I'm looking down his finger thinking, okay, right, oh, there it is. It was like a little cup about yay big and so big. So I asked the guy, how do you get people in that? Uh, you know what happened? We didn't end up going there. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know. 
But listen to this. The Bible says you were buried in baptism. I wonder, how do you get down in that cup? And notice the idea. It's a spiritual reality. It's a picture of what takes place. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the old man being buried and raised in the newness of life. How Christ has resurrected us and given us life. See, the idea is that how can you get stuck in that cup? You say, well, well, I just want to be sprinkled and throw some water on me. Understand, that's not being buried. Jesus came up out of the water. He literally went under and came back up. It signified, it pictured, if you would, His death, burial, and resurrection as well. So when we look at this idea, it's a spiritual reality. See, it pictures us being buried with Christ, but also being raised with Him through faith to a newness of life. The ordinance of baptism is always to be accomplished after someone has received Christ as their Savior. Because it shows what took place spiritually. And we can see the picture physically before us. Notice uh, D, if you would, uh, verse 13 and 14. Before salvation, we were dead in our sins. The word dead describes the spiritual state of every human being apart from Christ. Look at verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. See, being dead, it means that uh, because of our sin, that we have become spiritually dead towards God. And spiritually dead people do not respond to spiritual things. I don't know why, but uh, some of you might remember this. We were, when we were at the school years ago, we've been in our building now nine years, and we were at the school, and I was preaching on a Sunday morning. for It was during Christmas Sunday, so we're right around Christmas time, and I don't even remember why I was preaching this, but I talked about how dead people stink. On Christmas morning, could you imagine that? Everybody's all cleaned up and looking sharp or whatever. And so I'm shaking hands with this man as he comes through and we're getting ready to leave the church. I said, how are you doing this morning? And he says, I stink. And I said, well, brother, I don't want to tell you that. No, man, anyway, and I, said, I said, what do you mean you stink? He said, I'm spiritually dead. And I thought, man, isn't that a reality? That's exactly what we are when we're spiritual dead. We stink. Sin causes a stench in our lives. Sin causes a stench that, that we can't take care of. Why? Because the only one who can take care of it is the one who can make us alive. And that's Jesus Christ. See, the word dead describes the spiritual state of every human being apart from Christ. See, God made us alive when Christ, with Christ when He forgave all of our sins. And there's no spiritual life apart from the forgiveness of sin. I love this verse, and, and, and I really didn't really spend that much time thinking about it. And, and then this week, begin to study it out and begin to look at uh, what all these phrases meant and what exactly is Paul trying to put across to us in verse number 14. Because forgiveness is this, it's blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. The phrase, handwriting of ordinances, it refers to a certificate handwritten by a debtor to acknowledge their debt. Have you ever noticed when you go someplace, they want you to write something out when you use a card? I go to Ace Hardware every once in a while, and they're probably the only ones that ever make you do with a debit card. You put your debit card in, and they said you have to sign. And when you sign it, what you're saying is that you're acknowledging that you owe Ace Hardware a debt. And that debt will be paid by who? It will be paid by you. And so notice this handwriting of ordinances. It's much like signing a credit card receipt. But Paul goes on, and he says the phrase that was against us, and it means that the record requires that we pay. When I sign that, it means I'm going to pay. I am saying I will pay that. And when I sign that thing, what is it telling me? Is that it requires that I pay. I know we don't have debtor prison today, but I do know you could end up going to jail if you begin to run up bills and you don't pay. Amen? You could end up going to jail for that. You say, really? I have checks. If I have checks, it means I must have money. Amen? That doesn't mean that. But I have a card. Doesn't mean that either. But the whole idea is that I'm guaranteeing that I'm going to pay. It requires that we pay. The phrase blotting out the handwriting 
Look what he says again, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The phrase blotting out the handwriting means that the debt that we acknowledge that we owe and we don't have the ability to pay has been paid in full by Christ. You ever notice that those tracts that some people hand out says paid in full? That's exactly what it's telling us. We have a debt which we are, we are unable to pay. We can't pay it. But at least we acknowledge we have it. But we can't do anything about it. But guess what He's done? He did it on the cross of Calvary. He paid literally the debt that we owe of our sin. You say, wait a minute, the wages of sin is death. We owe something and we're going to have to pay and give an account one day for that. But notice what He has already done for us. Our responsibility is to acknowledge it and allow Him to save us so that we can be complete in Him. So that He can be all the fulfillment of all that we need. So we'll be equipped for the spiritual journey in which we go through in this world. Notice what Christ has done. He has paid it all for us. There's nothing that we can do to deserve our to, do, to deserve eternal life, to deserve salvation. He's already taken care of it. It's already, if you would, already marked, placed upon the cross of Calvary. So it means that we have a debt, and we acknowledge we have a debt. In fact, you know what's interesting to me? Most people today in the world, if you spend enough time with them, will admit. That, they're, that they have faults, that they're sinners. You ever notice that? A lot of people tell you, yeah, I know, I have a fault, I have a fault. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I know I'm a liar. I know I'm a cheater. I know all this stuff. I know that I'm a deceiver. I, I know all this. And I'm a thief. I know all of this stuff. So they'll acknowledge they have a debt. The problem is they won't acknowledge the debt has already been paid on the cross of Calvary. That's what we need to do as believers and begin to tell the world that's already been taken care of. All of this work and all of this effort that we try to put forth has already been taken care of on the cross. Already been paid for us. Paid in full. Don't you like it when you have a major bill and you get that stamp paid in full and they send it to you? I always ask them. I remember one time, Vicky and I, we were pretty far in debt. And uh, it was our own fault and and we used our credit cards too much and uh, pay them off regularly and whatever else. But we just got to the point where we finally said, we're getting out of debt. No more debt. We don't want any debt. We're through with debt. And so we began to pay these off. And I called the credit card company. I said, hey, I want the statement that says zero, zero, zero. I want that statement. And I want you to put on there if you're, if you're capable and able to do so. Man, bright red, paid in full. And I want that. He said, what would you do with them? Man, I put them, a, I put them back into a folder, and I still have a lot of them today. And every once in a while, when I think, well, hey, let's go out and do something stupid and, and waste some money, I, I go back and think, ah, nah, 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 nah. How I like to know it's been paid in full. But we, we get a desire to have our personal debts paid in full. Should we not want our spiritual debt to be paid in full also? And he already took care of it on Calvary. Our responsibility is to acknowledge we have a debt. But it goes one step further. We need to acknowledge it. We do not have the ability to pay it. But Christ paid it on Calvary. He took care of it for us. Our responsibility is to go to Him and ask Him to release us from that debt in which we have. Do you know why? Because Christ is all we need when it comes to salvation. But there's one more thing that I'm done this morning. Look at verse 15 with me. Christ is all we need for victorious living. We see that Christ is all we need to know God. And we see Christ is all we need uh, for salvation, but He's also all we need for victorious living. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled principalities and powers. Sometimes we think spoiled means that somebody gives me something uh, just because I throw a fit enough. I'm spoiled. I have to admit, I was, a, I was the only blue-eyed, blonde-haired grandchild. My grandmother spoiled me. I liked it. I flaunted it. I let everybody know, I am the favorite. I was the oldest grandboy, grand, grandson, 
And, I, and though this, she had another granddaughter, she was born in December, I was born in August, I liked being spoiled. I flaunted it. So when you read this, you think, oh, he spoiled Prince Palatine. So he gave them everything they wanted and built them up. That's not what the word spoiled means. The word spoiled here, it means to strip. Now, I don't want to be stripped of all my honor of being the firstborn son. Amen? I like being spoiled. But notice the idea is being stripped. And it's a picture of stripping a defeated enemy of his weapons and armor on the battlefield. When we read back in the Old Testament, we read that word spoiled a lot, don't we? We read that the children of Israel went in and they spoiled them. And sometimes we even read about the enemies of Israelites, that they would spoil the Israelites. And it means that they would go through and take all the good stuff, take all the weaponry, all the jewelry, all the gold, all the silver. They took the benefits of that. And notice what Christ did. He spoiled, He stripped the enemy of all of His power, all of His ability, all of those things that He has no power over us anymore. He can't exert power over us. Why? Because Christ has already stripped Him of it. He said, well, when did Christ do that? By coming out of the grave on the third day. Victoriously coming out. That's when He stripped the enemy of His power. I know that I don't believe that, that Jesus died on Friday, but I believe that He died three days previous to Sunday morning of being resurrected. And I think that Satan probably thought, I finally got Him. He's on the cross. But no doubt in my mind, when He came out of the grave, Jesus says, I've got you. Because now I'm alive again. I have defeated hell, grave, and even Satan that day when He came and He rose again on the third day, just exactly as he said that he would. He spoiled the principalities and power. He stripped all the principalities of power of their evil authority over us. Then notice what he did. You know, don't you love it? Sometimes I get irritated when I, I see these sports people. They get out there, especially in football or some other sport that's a team sport. And you see them do something great. And they go dancing around. Woo, woo, you know, all that other good stuff. And, you know, me, me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Look what I did. I did this. I did this. I looked at all the stuff I did. I did. I did. I did. And notice sometimes we get the idea that they, that's not, they didn't all do that. And sometimes we forget. They say we think that we got the victory. And sometimes we think that we've overcome. And we think that we've done all these great and mighty things. But notice something interesting. Jesus is the one that made a show of them. Where openly. And He has a right to do so. Because He overcame them. He defeated Satan and hell and the grave. So we can make a show of them openly. Here's the good news. When Jesus came out of the grave, it wasn't a secret thing. Five, if you go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you would realize in those verses about 527 individuals saw Jesus after His resurrection. That's a lot of witnesses, amen? It wasn't something that was hidden. He didn't sneak around and come out of the grave. Man, He came out of the grave and He openly showed that He was alive. Openly showed that He defeated the principalities and powers Openly showed that he had the power to do so. Openly showed. Man, Christ is all we need in victorious living. You know what? The older I get, the worse this world becomes. And the more I desire to go somewhere else. You say, well, where would you go? When I was in the army, I spent a year and a half in Korea. I liked that. was kind of a nice place to go. But I want to go and spend my life in Korea now? No, nah, not necessarily. Well, what about going to Canada? I mean, Canada seems like a nice place. I've never been there before. I kind of like the I thing. Hey, hey, I, I. You know, everything I was thinking, how you doing, I? You know, whatever they, at the end of it, I always say, and I thought that'd be kind of cool. Mexico, we went down to Mexico a few years ago, down to Guadalajara, man, what a beautiful city. That might be a nice place to live for eternity. In reality, none of those places. Because corruption is hidden no matter where we go. There's only one place that we can go where, where man has not corrupted, and that's heaven. <laughs> that's heaven. And that's the place that we're going to finally receive the victory in which we can experience, and the victory that we long for. But before we get to heaven, though, Christ has given us a victorious life now, and He desires for us to live a victorious life 
now. Now. Well, so preacher, how can we do that? It's dependency upon Him for our life now. It's dependency upon Him and trust Him. Man, he desires for us to know His Word, to read His Word, to live by His Word. That's how we have a victorious life now. Can I tell you something? It's not easy. It's not easy. But man, is it sure worth it. Because not only does He give us life now and victory now, He's going to give us abundant life as well now. We can experience now. Life of abundance now. You say, oh, that's good. I get all my stuff. No, it's not talking about physical abundance. It's talking about the abundance, spiritual abundance with us. Man, abundance of peace and joy. Abundance of rest. Of satisfaction of Christ. Knowing that we're complete in Him. That's what He desires to give us now. Life. Don't you like living life? Man, I love life. I hope I let you know that. Man, I love life. Vicky tells me the last thing I do before I fall asleep is giggle. She says, you do this. <laughs> then I pass out. I don't believe her. The same way she says I snore. I don't ever, I never hear myself snore. She says to you before, right before you go to sleep, you go, <laughs> then I like life. But you know what? I don't believe I had that type of life without Christ. And I don't believe we can have that type of life without the abundancy of the, of the life that Christ wants to give us. I think we can giggle before we go to sleep in peace because we give us life, abundant life, and we have the guarantee of eternal life. Hey, when we have those things in us, that's when we can truly begin to live a victorious life and begin to realize that Christ truly is all we need to live a victorious life. Well, preacher, if I do better, can I do it? If I just try the 12 steps and a hop and a skip and a jump, surely this ought to get me where I ought to go. That's not going to help us either. It's a dependency upon Christ and allowing Christ to give us the life in which He desires for us to live. Hey, can I tell you something honestly? Christ is all we need. We say, what about tomorrow with the government? <laughs> Governments come, governments go. Sometimes, amen, sometimes not quick enough, but they go, amen. They leave, they're gone. But notice, Christ is something that's steadfast and sure. He's the one that we can anchor our lives on. He's the one that truly is the author, the finisher of our faith. He's the one that gives us hope. When we begin to focus upon those things and focus upon Him, I guarantee you, that's when our life truly becomes victorious. Because the things of this world no longer matter, no longer hold us back, no longer can deceive us and pull us and ensnare us because we are tempted to live above those things. You say, preacher, what can I do then if I, man, I want to live a victorious life, but man, I'm making a step forward and all of a sudden I got ensnared. Come to Christ. Just to say, Lord, I, I, I've sinned. I've, forgive me. I'm confessing this to you. And here's the good news. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. Good news. Well, if I make a mistake, what do I do? Come to Christ and tell Him. Hey, I made a mistake, Lord. If you come this morning and you do without Christ as your Savior, that's the place you need to be. You need to ask Him to come into your heart and save you. And ask Him to give you eternal life. And He desires to do so. Acknowledge you have a debt you cannot pay. Acknowledge that He's paid the debt for you, already done, already been taken care of on the cross of Calvary. Father, this morning, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the Apostle Paul. I thank You, Lord, that he just lays out to us. Because no doubt in his day, as in our day, there's so many things in which we can pursue. Lord, there's so many distractions and so many things that seem to be what we need to, to follow after. And he tells us that Christ is all we need. He, we are complete in him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and let me ask you something.